um, evangelical Christian and then in college, I became really interested in feminist theory um, and particularly postmodern feminism. And that became my general worldview and also my um, realm of academic study. And then I, I kind of bizarrely and, and strangely and suddenly converted to Catholicism at the age of 30. So I have been have steeped in feminist and gender theory for 20 years. And now I'm, I'm still in it, I'm still fascinated by it, but I'm trying to kind of come at it from a Catholic perspective. And so this book um, on which this lecture is based kind of gives a, a brief history of how the concept of gender has developed over the 20th century, and then also compares what I call the gender paradigm to um, the Genesis paradigm or a Catholic understanding of reality. I can remember when I was in grad school in gender studies, we were reading, I think a text by, I don't know, one of the French philosophers, it was Levinas or Derrida, um, and he was, he was writing as a woman. He kind of just declares this and begins writing as a woman. And in my very secular um, feminist studies master's cohort, we, you know, we all had this kind of resounding consensus that he couldn't just do that, right? A man can't just simply step into the place and perspective or voice of a woman. But somehow, like embodiment matters, right? And I never would have imagined that just 14 or 15 years later, we would now be in a very um, contentious battle about the very definition of what a woman is. So, what is a woman? What is a man? And why is there so much controversy around these topics? Why is there so much debate now about something that used to seem so obvious? How did we get here? That's a question I'm very interested in. And also, where do we look for clarity? How did we get here, and where should we go? So this lecture will explore the genesis of gender in two ways, like I just described. So first, I'll give kind of a sketch, a linear sketch of how the concept of gender developed. Um, and then I'm going to move into a worldview or paradigm comparison between the gender paradigm and the genesis paradigm. So let's start with the gender paradigm. So first, I would like to um, ask for some feedback a little bit. What is gender? Just throw out some definitions. No pressure. Anybody have anything? Every day everyone's like, I'm not saying a thing. <laughs> You're not going to trick me. Uh, what is, yeah, what is gender? Any, any, any ideas? Sexual orientation, OK. What else? An inner felt. Okay, right? An inner sense of self? Good. Yeah? I think the correct answer is a social construct. Ooh, the correct answer. <laughs> wow, that's very confident. Okay, a social construct, right? That's one. Of, that's certainly an, an answer on offer, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's a few. Um, gender is just, you know, this is kind of like, I don't know, my parents probably are just like, gender or sex, you know? Um, and then gender as this inner state of the soul or the psyche, that's another option. Um, gender as a, a social construct, or maybe even more specifically, a socially compelled performance, right? I get that from the philosophy of Judith Butler. Um, we have the kind of second wave feminist distinction between biological sex and then gender. But I don't know if you'll notice, even just this kind of smattering of various definitions, there are some very real tensions and even contradictions. For example, how could gender be both a state of the soul or psyche and also be completely socially constructed, right? So those, those there's a little tension there if, there if that's an essentialist narrative about the state of the soul. All right, so behind each of these definitions, I would argue, is an implicit anthropology or an understanding of the human person, as well as an implicit or understanding of ontology or reality. <coughs> so let's trace a brief history of this term gender. And I like to start the story with uh, Simone de Beauvoir, French philosopher. So in my account of the development of the gender paradigm, existentialist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir looms large. And that may seem strange, considering that Simone de Beauvoir uses the term sex rather than gender, right? So she wrote The Second Sex, that's her most favorite work, in 1949. So the word gender doesn't even appear in that, right? The second sex. But nonetheless, I think that she's really important in the development. So prior to the mid-1950s, gender was a generic term that meant kind of category or kind. And um, you might find references to the feminine gender as a synonym for womankind, but it was more customary to speak of words having gender as words do in various languages like Spanish or Russian. 
So Pavard didn't use the term gender, but she introduces the concept that the term gender would soon come to mean. And that concept is expressed in her well-known line, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. That statement is the mustard seed of contemporary gender theory. So the basic idea that she's professing here is that females, female human beings, are socialized into becoming women. So she's making a distinction between the idea of woman and female, arguing that woman is a social and cultural fabrication that is then kind of layered onto the biological reality of femaleness. So her thought prefigures a turn toward this concept of gender. And that would begin in the following decade after The Second Sex was published, and really take hold in the 1970s, largely due to the work of psychologist John Money. Money was one of the first prominent advocates of a tabula rasa view of the human person. So human beings are not born, we are made. He argued that biological sex has no intrinsic connection to men and women's social roles and behaviors. So he drew a clear distinction between sex and then what he called gender. So finally we get this term here. A social identity that was a product of culture rather than nature. So money is the first person to coin the term gender role, right? A term that's very familiar now and commonplace. So John Money's most famous patient was David Reamer. And so David Reamer was brought to him as a baby. Um, after his penis was disfigured in a circumcision. Money, who believed that gender was socially constructed and entirely malleable in the first few years of life, convinced David's parents to raise him as a girl and entrust him to Money's clinical supervision. Now, David happened to be an identical twin, so twin brother. And Money saw a golden opportunity to run basically a controlled experiment to test his theory about the malleability of gender. And David's parents agreed, unfortunately, and he was subjected to further genital surgeries as an infant and renamed Brenda. As part of his ongoing experiment, Money met with the twins throughout their childhood and his sessions with them were pretty disturbing and invasive, involving what we would now see as clear instances of sexual abuse, such as compelling the two children to enact various sexual positions and inspect one another's genitalia in order to, in his mind, kind of enculturate the correct sort of gender identity that he wanted them to have. Money's attempt to demonstrate the veracity of these idea, ideas failed catastrophically. So as a teenager, David became suicidal. He rejected his female identity. He learned the truth about the fact that he was actually male. And then he tried to kind of put his life together as an adult. He married, he adopted some children. Um, but then he killed himself in 2004 at the age of 38, just two years after his twin brother also committed suicide. So both of the subjects in Money's experiment um, ended up taking their own lives. So his theory about this malleability of gender proved not only to be erroneous, but fatal for his two research subjects. But like I said, that didn't happen until the early 2000s. So between the 1970s and the early 2000s, Money was publishing on his work. And especially in the 1970s, his concept of gender became really influential in feminist theory and swept through the academy. Um, and became really important in the humanities, social sciences. Second wave feminists in particular latched onto this idea of gender because they saw, a, they saw in it a helpful concept, a site of resistance to essentialism, the idea that men and women are essentially different. So instead of relying on sex to classify men and women, a new paradigm emerged that distinguished between sex as a basic biological reality and gender as a collection of socially constructed norms and ideals that are associated with each sex and then mistakenly read as natural. This is the classic sex-gender split, um, the second wave feminist understanding of sex and gender that I inherited when I began my feminist studies about 20 years ago. So in this understanding, sex refers to biology and gender refers to the social meanings attached to sex. Now we can see why this distinction would have appealed to feminists, because it facilitated an important move beyond reductive and often misogynistic definitions of what it means to be a woman. So historically, arguments that appeal to supposedly natural weaknesses or deficiencies in women were used to justify denying them certain rights and opportunities, like the right to vote or attend a nice place like this, which didn't admit women um, initially. And at times, differences between the sexes have been understood as differences in value and then translated into rigid and sex-specific roles creating an implied hierarchy of superiority and inferiority in favor of men. So without this concept of gender as distinct from sex, 
ideas about women were easily naturalized, and social ideas about women were easily naturalized and seen as innate or inevitable, rather than distortions of culture. So with this concept of gender, feminists could um, better resist those narratives. However, in the late 1980s and 90s, and the third wave of feminism, this neat sex-gender distinction that I just described began to unravel, thanks largely to the work of Judith Butler, who's really the godmother of contemporary gender theory. So Butler ups the ante of social constructionism. So she asserts that biological sex itself is a social fabrication. As it, I have the quote here, this is from her work, Gender Trouble. Female no longer appears to be a stable notion. Its meaning is as troubled and unfixed as woman. So Butler leans into many of the ideas that we see in Simone de Beauvoir's work, but takes them to new extremes. Near the end of the second sex, Simone de Beauvoir writes, nothing is natural. And so for Butler, that statement is a foundational premise. Nothing is natural. Butler's primary goal as a theorist is to dismantle the normalization of heterosexual relationships. So our tendency to see male and female sexual relationships as normal and natural, which in theory speak is called heteronormativity. For Butler, the idea that humankind is characterized by two sexes that are biologically complementary is a social fiction rather than a matter of fact. Now the key to comprehending Judith Butler is to grasp the reliance on the postmodern philosophy of Michel Foucault. I would argue that most inhabitants of the gender paradigm have unwittingly adopted a de facto Foucaultian worldview, inherited at least in part through what I call trickle-down Judith Butler. Because most people actually haven't read Judith Butler, or if they've tried, they've just been um, really frustrated because she's incredibly hard to read. So let's look at a passage from Undoing Gender up here on the screen. A question of who and what is considered real and true is apparently a question of knowledge. But it is also, as Michel Foucault makes plain, a question of power. Having or bearing truth and reality is an enormously powerful prerogative within the social world. One way that power dissimulates as ontology. Power dissimulates as ontology. Ontology refers to the philosophy of being, of what exists. So what Butler is saying here is that what we perceive to be real is actually a fiction that is created and enforced by institutional power. So in the postmodern perspective, truth is suspended in air quotes is ultimately <laughs> unknowable or even non-existent, depending how far um, one goes. All that remains is power. Knowledge then is not a matter of discerning what is true because truth itself is a construction of power. Foucault uses the term knowledge power with a hyphen, to encapsulate this idea, and that's a term picked up by Butler. This philosophical approach leads to a particular political approach. So strategically using language to subvert categories and to create or shape the kind of understanding of reality that one wants. Now this creates something of a paradox that I think is really interesting. So Butlerian gender theory, as I've been describing it, is fundamentally anti-realist. It rejects the idea that sex and gender, including the terms female, man, woman, rejects the idea that those name something real. Instead, those concepts are linguistic power moves that create the illusion of something real. So men don't really exist, women don't really exist, female is maleness, these words are just constructs. Right? And yet, we regularly hear in activist rhetoric, in popular rhetoric, from pop culture, social media, emphatic claims about reality. So for example, like, trans women are women, or sex is a spectrum. Those statements are making clear assertions about what is real. Those are making reality claims. So there's this interesting reification term that's happening here. To reify means to make real. So the gender paradigm depends upon a radically constructivist and anti-realist view of reality in order to dismantle categories and create new ones. And then there is a pivot, and these new categories are reified as actually and really true. Most people who embrace the gender paradigm are not hardcore anti-realists, I would say, at least not consciously. Uh, probably most of the people who say, who, who make an identity claim, like I am a woman or I am a man, they're saying, no, I am really a woman or I am really a man. They're not just saying, like, women don't really exist, men don't really exist, so I can kind of say whatever I want. Most people don't perceive themselves or reality in that way. But I think the people who 
have embraced the gender paradigm, have unknowingly entered a paradigm that is at root, at root based in philosophical postmodern anti-realism. So this situation has led to an almost inverse understanding of the original sex-gender split. If you'll remember, it used to be sex is biological, gender is a construct. Well now, bio biological sex is often talked about as the construct, whereas gender as this kind of internal identity is real and unchangeable, more real than sex itself. So ultimately, I would argue, the concept of gender has helped drive a wedge between body and identity. Sex once referred to a bodily given of active nature. In the gender paradigm, the power of the body to ground or to constitute identity is diminished. A woman no longer simply refers to one's sex, but rather to one's gender, which has become an amorphous cultural construction that has a tenuous relationship or no relationship to bodily sex. So let's, let's transition here and leave from our linear story and move into a comparison of the gender paradigm, which I've been describing, and then what I'm going to call the Genesis paradigm. So some of you might be wondering, why Genesis? Why is this lady going to be talking about this super ancient text from the Near East? Why should we return to that to understand the 21st century situation? Well, I'm a Catholic, and I'm, I guess I'm, I'm Macintyrian in that I think we should approach questions like this from within a clearly articulated worldview, a clearly articulated account of reality, rather than from some supposedly neutral space. So every stance on this issue, I think, will take some account of reality for granted. So let's be upfront about it, and that's where we have to begin. Like I mentioned earlier, definitions of gender make claims about anthropology, what a human person is, and ontology, so about who we are and what is real. These are not tertiary issues. These are foundational. And so approaching this topic from within a Catholic perspective requires that we take into account divine revelation, scripture, and tradition. So we can't answer the question of gender from outside scripture, from outside the worldview that it gives us, but only from within that way of seeing that our tradition gives us. I'm using spatial metaphors here, right? Within the worldview, without a worldview, because scripture is first, it's not really a rule book, right? Like I was kind of raised in a context more where scripture was like this cosmic car manual, just kind of told you how to like fix what's broken, and it's rules to follow. But okay, then there's a little bit of that on campus in the, in the Bible, okay. But as a whole, scripture doesn't just give us rules, it gives us a way of seeing, a way of making judgments about truth and falsehood, right and wrong, based on that way of seeing. And you have to enter into it, right? That's why I'm using the word paradigm, this framework of basic assumptions that shape our understanding of the world. Now, Genesis specifically is important because Genesis is our origin story. In the ancient world, origin stories are not about material origins, right? That's a modern pre preoccupation. The ancient writers of Genesis were not concerned about the exact age of the earth, the evolution of species, right? Origin stories were about giving an account of identity and purpose. And in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees about divorce, he refers back to Genesis, to this original order of creation. And his turn toward Genesis is a significant note. He does not appeal to law when confronted with questions about how men and women should relate to one another. He appeals to cosmology, to the sacred narratives of Genesis that give an account of our identity and purpose as human beings. So as a Catholic, I say that Genesis still speaks the truth about men and women, about human beings, about who we are created to be. Especially the first four chapters, Genesis is our origin story, and it reveals to us our ideology, our anthropology, and our teleology. So where we come from, who we are, and what we're made for. What our purpose is. So let's get into it. How do these two paradigms compare in their understandings of reality, creation, freedom, the body, language, and sexual difference? So here's a little bit of Bible. You guys can just sort of Look at it. I know you're Catholic, you probably don't know what the Bible says. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Alright, so this is a this is a bit of Genesis 1, verses 24 through 31. And in some ways I almost don't want you to read it. I almost just want you to look at the fact that even just visually what jumps out to you as soon as you rest your eyes on this slide. Verse 20, 27, right? It's like, just it jumps out. It's suddenly a different format. It's in verse. The rest of it's in prose. What's going on there? 
or the little spotlight on that one. All right, so who creates in these two paradigms? In the gender paradigm, it's human beings. It's human beings who ultimately create reality, truth, and meaning. But in Genesis, there's a creator. There is a ground of truth, reality, and meaning, a loving God. And this is a God who makes himself known, who desires to be in relationship with his creation. So in the Genesis paradigm, human beings are creatures. We are beings in relation to a God who made us and who in this very instant is holding us in existence. We do not come from a nothing and return to nothingness. We come from someone and we return to him. In Genesis 1, creation unfolds as this integral, interconnected whole, this cosmos. And each stage of this unfolding, each nested layer, is pronounced by God as good. There's a subtle sense of momentum as the narrative builds, and each created interval increases in beauty and complexity, reaching this apex with the creation of human beings who bear the image of their creator. They are not made to be slaves. They are tasked with tending the earth and filling it with life. The Genesis cosmology bestows upon human beings an exclusive kind of dignity, a dignity rooted in their roles as image bearers. And moreover, Genesis 1 here recognizes the natural duality of humankind, male and female. And this difference is part of the goodness of creation, so that's something important to realize. And both sexes share fully in the divine image and the commission to tend the earth. What about reality? In the gender paradigm, because human beings are the creators, reality is something human made, a construct. While there might be some level of biological facticity, any meaning or categorization or interpretation of that facticity is a linguistic and social construct. But in the Genesis paradigm, reality is a gift. There's a givenness to the world, to the nature of things, that is not created by us, but intrinsic to the way things are. So what does Genesis tell us about the created cosmos? It is orderly, it is an interconnected whole, it is good. Reality is not under our control, but we have been entrusted with its care, not to recreate it in our own image, but to tend it, to attend to its wholeness and interconnectedness and goodness. Those are the distinctive emphases of Genesis 1. The reality we inhabit is a divinely created order, a harmonious cosmos, and this order is good. Reality is not something we create, it is something we receive. That's a big distinction, a big differentiation between the gender paradigm and the Genesis paradigm. All right, let's bring some Genesis 2 in here. That's where things get real interesting. We're zooming in here, right? We're in kind of the, the mud and clay of the garden near these rivers that are named. We get like this address. It's, very, it's this very concrete, sort of embodied creation narrative in Genesis 2. So what does it say about bodies? There are actually two cosmologies in Genesis. The first chapter describes creation from this transcendent vantage point. This God's eye view is that the narrator is suspended above the universe and watching things flash into existence. The second chapter of Genesis zooms in the narrator brings us down to the dust of Eden, this earthly paradise. God is depicted in bodily terms, walking, strolling with the first humans in this lush garden. The first cosmology emphasizes God's transcendence, and the second shows us his intimacy. The second creation account cuts almost immediately to the creation of the first human being. God forms the human, or the Adam. It's not yet a proper name when that word, the Adam, is first used. It's like this, this earthling, this mud thing, this mud man from the hummus, so God forms the human from the hummus of the soil and breathes into his body, and that animates and brings him to life. This imagery reveals an important truth about our nature. We are both earth and breath, matter and spirit. We are physical creatures. Our bodies are integral to who we are. But we are not merely matter, we're not merely bodies, because God's breath enlivens each of us with an immaterial soul. So this is one of the foundational principles of the Catholic anthropology. Every human being is a unity of body and soul. And there's more if we keep digging into this. Genesis 2 emphasizes another vital principle. The body reveals the person. Our bodies are the visible reality through which we manifest 
are hidden and are hidden in your mind. Each person's existence is entirely unrepeatable. And our unique personhood can only be made known to others through the frame of our embodiment. This makes our body sacramental, making visible what is invisible. This sacramentality is displayed in the man's immediate recognition of the woman. They haven't yet spoken. She has not verbally introduced herself, but it is her body that speaks the truth of her identity. And this truth is immediately recognized by the man. He is struck with joy and wonder at the revelation of a, of a person who, with whom he can at last have communion. So our bodies serve a sacramental function. They reveal and communicate a spiritual reality. In verse 18 of Genesis 2, something unexpected happens. God looks at his creation, and instead of echoing what he said in Genesis 1, he says the opposite words for the first time. He says, it is not good for a man to be it is not good that a human being is solitary, one of a kind. This human, this Adam, this hummus man, needs a counterpart, a companion. And this, this begins one of my favorite passages in Genesis, this parade of animals. So God starts making all these, and shaping, molding all these creatures, and like presenting each before the human to see what he's going to call it. There's something comical about this imagery, right? Like, here comes God with a monkey and a gopher. The, the Adam scopes it out and shakes his head and then names it, and then this kind of misfit pageant continues. So eventually God takes a different approach, and he puts the human in a deep sleep, and from his side, God forms the first woman and presents her before the Adam. So John Paul II, when he interprets this passage, he reads this sleep as the sleep of non-being. So God takes the first human out of existence entirely and brings two new human beings into existence that are marked by sexual difference man and woman. So he replaces this non-sex, solitary human being with a humanity that is differentiated into two modes of being human. And this, repeat, this reading is, is uh, supported by a shift in terminology, right? So the Adam becomes Ish, man. The Adam, who can now properly be called a man, issues a cry of wonder upon seeing the woman for the first time, at last. Listen to the delight and relief in those words, at last. He immediately recognizes in the silent declaration of her body that she is both like him, more like him than any other earthly creature, and not like him. She resembles him in their shared humanity, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, but differs in the feminine form of her humanity. Genesis bat offers this balance between sameness and difference between the sexes. And this is a difficult balance to maintain. Most theories of gender lose this balance. They either veer into extremes of uniformity, where men and women aren't really different, they're basically interchangeable, or like polarity, like men are from Mars, women are from Venus, like men have waffle brains, and women are like spaghetti monsters. Or whatever. But both of those extremes lose that fruitful tension that's expressed here in Genesis, that sameness and difference. The opening act of the second cosmology could be read as an origin story of sexual difference itself, proclaiming that our identities as men and women matter. They carry sacred significance and occupy a prominent place in our worldview. Did you notice that the two times that the text breaks out in verse, in both of the snippets I showed you, are both about sexual difference? It's like, as soon as we're talking about sexual difference, we can't just talk anymore, we have to sing. Genesis uniquely foregrounds the importance of the male-female relationship, but this is not a relationship of domination, but reciprocity. There's no hierarchy of value, no dynamic of superiority and inferiority. And in the Genesis paradigm, sexual differentiation is not a mishap, it's not a bug. It's a cause for celebration and wonder. This difference is good, our bodies are good, and both of these things are an integral part of the created order, which is good. These two paradigms also have differing understandings of the relationship between language and truth. Both of the Genesis cosmologies depict a particular relationship between language and reality. In the first account, God uses language to create the cosmos out of nothing. He draws order and being out of nothingness. In the second account, it's the Adam, the man, who uses language to name what God creates. Divine speech makes reality, and human speech identifies reality. In the parade of animals, the, the human's act of naming does not impose meaning. It recognizes meaning that objectively exists. God creates the animal, presents it to the man, 
and the man discerns its nature and bestows a name that proclaims that nature. This dynamic is most obvious in the naming of woman. The man recognizes that the woman shares his nature, but in a modality that is distinct from his own. She is simultaneously like him and unlike him. After seeing this truth that's proclaimed by her body, the man chooses a word that corresponds to that twofold reality, isha, woman, a word that includes ish, man, while adding something new. So these terms, man and woman, first appear in the text during this climactic encounter. This is a moment of mutual recognition. The man is both naming the woman and renaming himself. It is through encountering her nature that he's able to better understand his own. Throughout this account, naming is depicted as a linguistic response to that which is being named. Reality then exists prior to our naming it. And our language is true and meaningful only so far as it corresponds to that which exists. The understanding of language portrayed in Genesis contrasts starkly with the view that dominates contemporary debates about <clears throat> gender. Most gender theories hold that what we think of as reality is a linguistic and social construction. Our use of the words man and woman, so the theory goes, create an illusion that sex is binary. This constructivist view of language is a complete inversion of the correspondence view that's depicted in Genesis. In this divinely revealed origin story, our language does not project meaning onto things. Rather, meaning intrinsically exists in what God creates. And this meaning is intellig intelligible to us. And language, which I think is a mark of God's image in us, enables us to proclaim that inherent meaning. Lastly, freedom. In the gender paradigm, freedom is pushing past limits, dismantling norms, blurring boundaries. In the existentialist feminism of de Beauvoir, freedom is defined as transcending our facticity our concrete materiality as human beings through creating our own meaning. In the postmodern gender theory of Judith Butler, freedom means subverting categories that are said to be natural or based in our nature. In other words, freedom is transgression. But in the Genesis paradigm, freedom is belonging. Freedom is found by becoming who we were made to be. This is a fresco from 1425 about the expulsion. It's depicting the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. The Genesis narrative follows an entropic trajectory from harmony to fragmentation. The original wholeness of Eden disintegrates layer by layer into conflict and division. That's what sin is ultimately, a corruption of wholeness, an unraveling. Ours is an origin story that ends in exile. Adam and Eve expelled from Eden and left to wander the earth. Could this be a vision of freedom, perhaps? Human beings no longer corralled in God's garden, encumbered by God's rules, liberated. Adam and Eve, look at them, they're liberated. They can go find their own meaning, seek their own destiny. This is what freedom has become for us in our historical moment. Stripped from teleology, our ultimate purpose, freedom has been reduced to permissiveness, pushing past limits, transgressing boundaries. But in Genesis, the exile from Eden is not triumphant. It is funereal, agonizing, weighted down by the call of death. We are confronted in our time with two divergent understandings of meaning, of freedom, sorry. On the one hand, freedom according to postmodernity, this open-ended process of self-definition whose only limit is death. On the other, freedom as an ever-deepening sense of belonging and wholeness not only within oneself, but in relation to all that is. To be Christian is to regard oneself in relation to the cosmos, and the cosmos in relation to God. How we choose to relate to one of these, self, creation, God, influences how we relate to all of them. I cannot truly honor creation if I don't honor my own body, which itself is a part of creation. <laughs> Pope Francis emphasizes this connection in a passage from Laudato Si that is worth quoting in its entirety. The acceptance of our bodies as God's gift is vital for welcoming and accepting the entire world as a gift from the Father and our common home. Whereas thinking that we enjoy absolute power over our own bodies turns often subtly into thinking that we enjoy absolute power over creation. Learning to accept our body, to care for it, and to respect its fullest meaning is an essential element in any genuine human ecology. 
Also, valuing one's own body and its femininity or masculinity is necessary if I'm going to be able to recognize myself in an encounter with someone who is different. In this way, we can joyfully accept the specific gifts of another man or woman, the work of God the Creator, and find mutual enrichment. It is not a healthy attitude which would seek to cancel out sexual difference because it no longer knows how to confront it. That final sentence takes a jab at the gender paradigm. Pope Francis rightly sees that a disembodied concept of gender is something that ultimately erases sexual difference. Our ability to embrace the beauty of the world is connected to our ability to embrace the givenness of our own bodies. The body is a gift. That's the Catholic view. Embodiment binds us to all other life, all other matter. Think of the intimacy of taking a breath, drawing the inhalation of other organisms into your, the exhalation of other organisms into your lungs, borrowing a bit of their life to sustain yours. Think of the intimacy of eating, welcoming the matter of plants and animals, absorbing it into your flesh, drawing strength and energy from the fruit of the earth. Think about the intimacy of walking, trusting in each moment that the ground will hold you up, this trust that is so implicit it remains unthought. It is not the idealized body that is a gift, the body adorned with ornamental muscle, the body with long limbs and smooth skin, the airbrushed body suspended in the amber of perpetual health and conventional beauty. We find the body's giftedness in its finitude, its limits, its flaws, because these limits reveal to us our interdependence and awaken us to our ultimate vocation, which is to give and to receive love. In all these questions, this debate and confusion surrounding gender, we must, cons we must consider these questions from within the scope of a Christian cosmos, as Catholics. We have to be attentive to the foundation, to the frame, to the assumptions that are being made about reality and anthropology, and how those compare with a Catholic understanding of reality in the human person. If you don't make a conscious decision about the worldview or paradigm you choose to inhabit, that decision will be made for you, likely without you realizing it. So as Catholics, we should read gender through Genesis and Genesis through the life of Christ. That means taking Genesis ser seriously as a divinely revealed cosmology that describes to us our origin to and give us an account of who we are now. And within the redemptive order of grace, we can recover that wonder, right? I mean, that wonder at our asymmetrical difference. And we can recognize anew the abundance of the gift, the gift of our bodies, the gift of our shared humanity, and the gift of sexual difference. to just answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. Um, so first, thank you so much for coming. This is really cool talk. So I'm really interested in this postmodern complete loss of nature, the idea that nothing is natural. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a necessary conclusion from modernism or liberalism, or do you see it as something entirely new? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I, this is something I'm thinking about, right? Because I, I don't know much about political theory, I have to say. I'm, so I've just started reading some of the critiques of liberalism and I find them compelling, right? But then I'm also like, what's the alternative, you know? So um, that's a really good question. I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm equipped to answer it, but certainly I think in modernity, we see this changing relationship to nature, right? Nature, this, this technological conquest of nature. And so I certainly would see this as just an extension of that trend, right? Now we're just, it's, it's the human body that is now the nature that is, is being kind of conquered by technology. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a pretty clear, that's a pretty straight line, I think, down the, down the road from that. Like, Catholic doctrine, as it develops over time, like, often integrate, like, the philosophical system, sort of, like, mm -hmm. into its teaching, and that, like, sort of causes growth in the mm -hmm. doctrine, but, you know, but some things it doesn't reject. So I'm just thinking about this gender paradigm, it's built on a lot of modern principles about like rooted in experience and subjectivism. And I'm wondering, can we like sort of find the good in that 
Mm -hmm. um, the philosophical system, like that kind of in a certain way, have like a fuller, richer, even more Catholic understanding of what sexuality is, or is it something that we should reject? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I think I think there's truth to be found in it in almost anything, right? So, um, I mean, I am definitely making the case that there's pretty clear divergences in terms of worldview between the paradigm that we see, just mainly because of the anti-realism. Like once you once you have that, that that really creates kind of a gulf with the Catholic understanding. But I do think that, um, I think perhaps there's more goodness to be found, not so much even like, okay, well here's something that's true, that's, that's true actually about postmodernism, or even like Michel, Michel Foucault's and Judith Butler's kind of understanding of reality, which is that language actually can profoundly shape our understanding of reality. What I'm saying is, but reality pushes back. Okay, so there, there is a reality, and if we use language in a way that kind of shapes reality that's actually at odds with the real, then that's a problem, right? Whereas Judith Butler wouldn't see that there's actually a real kind of pushing back, so that's totally, that's totally fine. Um, so I do think that, that it's right to call attention to the power of language. I guess I would say that power is being misused in the gender paradigm, um, but it's being used quite well. It's being it's being used quite successfully in our culture right now because it's primarily through changing definitions of words that this paradigm has become so prevalent. Um, so I think, in some ways, I think that what I think about a lot when I think about this gender is actually like the role of language and how important language is and how powerful language is, and also what it looks like to steward our own language well which is tricky. It's not always like a clear cut um, answer what that is. And you, you mentioned subjective experience. So that's, so I think something, um, something else that can be, um, I, I guess in the, in some versions of the gender paradigm, there are desires expressed in that paradigm that are good. Desires for authenticity, desires for wholeness, desires for community. I think my my critique really is that the things that it promise, I think the, the things probably that people are seeking who go into the gender paradigm are good things, but I don't think the gender paradigm can provide those, right? Um, so it's making a promise it can't deliver. I also think that there's kind of this looping effect, right? There's all kinds of different experiences someone might have that would draw them to the gender paradigm, right? To think, yes, this explains my experience in a way that matters. So I think there have always been and will always be, you know, people who don't conform to gender norms. And I think that's great. I think that's awesome. Um, in some ways, I'm one of those people and certainly was a lot more when I was younger. I think the problem is that this framework has become the predominant framework for given to people for them to interpret their own experiences of those things, and that that framework isn't good. Mm. Right? Um, yeah. So I guess that's that's one thing. I'd say. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It was really good. Um, it, was, it struck me as you were talking that maybe one of the things going on, especially based on what you said at the end, like you know that there's a there's this real dignity to our bodies and mm -hmm. they serve this real sacramental purpose, um, but that means that they're relativized. They're ultimately not the most important thing. And it seems like in the paradigm you're talking about, people expect their bodies to deliver more than they can. You know, if, if yeah. our bodies become the locus of our identity. Um, that is asking it to do something that, you know, that's not, you know, a sacrament reveals something that's not it itself, I see. right? Yeah. You know, and so our bodies, like you said, our bodies reveal our persons, and our persons 
cannot just simply be reduced down to our bodies. Mm -hmm. Like our bodies have this secondary role mm -hmm. in our personal complex. And so yeah. I strike me a lot of the things that we see today involve this strange both like over elevation of the body, but also then a denigration of the mm -hmm. body. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, as you're talking, one thought I've had too that, you know, in some, in certain expressions of a transgender anthropology, and there are like, you know, there's not like one standard trans narrative on you. You talk to all kinds of different trans people who, who explain their experiences differently. But in one, there is, there's almost this desire to achieve a sacramentality, right? I want my body to, ex I want my body to re reveal the invisible and I don't feel like it does, right? I mean, that's a really, that's actually a really beautiful desire. And I, don't know, I would say like a deeply Catholic desire, that desire for the body to reveal the person. But I think that, I think the mistake that's being made is that the sacramentality of the body and the Catholic understanding isn't something you have to achieve. It isn't something you produce yourself. It's something that's always already happening, right? So it's, it's like, there's a, it's a gift we receive. It's not a project we have to complete, you know? Um, yeah. I guess one other, one other thing that I see that's maybe true um, in particular, you know, I do think that, well, it's interesting. On the one hand, in the gender paradigm, I think there, there are times, either even consciously or subconsciously, a reaction against things like overly restricted norms about what men and women should be, how they should look. I think what, but then ironically, I think sometimes the gender paradigm actually reinstates those very restrictive ideas. Like, oh, you know, you're a boy and you really love art and dancing and you hate war movies, like maybe you're really a girl. I mean, that kind of, that kind of naturalizes or essentializes stereotypes, right? So I think there's actually something very freeing in rooting gender in the body because then it expands like our possibilities about what it looks like to be a woman, what it looks like to be a man, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a man. Whereas if we kind of restrict, I think sometimes one of the ironic outcomes of the gender paradigm is that it actually narrows the boxes of man and woman. And it kind of pushes people who don't conform to stereotypes outside of those boxes altogether. And that's really interesting because there's almost this mirroring that happens between like very regressive understandings of like what men and women are, or what makes someone a man or a woman, and then like very progressive understanding of sometimes they'll look a lot alike, right? Like what it means to be a woman is to kind of like have big boobs and wear high heels, you know, and that that's how you kind of achieve womanhood. Um, it becomes like this kind of form, it becomes this embodiment of a stereotype. Um, so I actually think that if, if we root gender or man and woman in like, a woman is an adult human female, then there are so many different kinds of women there can be in the world, right? It's open things, it opens things up that I think is actually pretty nice. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, yellow coat. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I just love what you were saying about, um, yeah, encountering her nature allows him to better understand his own mm -hmm. her Adam and Eve. And I guess that I've been going back a lot to the, the Trinitarian basis of that. That mm. he in, in Genesis one you had up there, Adam was created in the image and likeness of the Trinity. When it says. Um, yeah, after after our image and after our, like creating yeah, yeah, that plural like, mm -hmm. after our, um, and just the beauty of that that I, I think that a lot of the time we're when you were saying we try to find the body's gift in the finitude, um, we there is a beauty to the fact that man by itself by himself is not complete, um, yeah. and that oftentimes people are, are striving for saying I, yeah I want to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we look at it from the basis of the Trinity, that actually we're not complete and that's a gift, that we're created in the image and likeness of the Trinity and, and this complete self-gift. Um, mm -hmm. And that actually elevates this understanding of, of, of the sexual act to mm -hmm. something that is elevated to the point where the, the self-gift of the father to the son and the son to the father is what we view sexual love as. Mm -hmm. That it's like actually really wonderful and beautiful um, and that we get to wonder at that. Yeah, that love. Yeah, and sex is the love between the father mm -hmm. and the son of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. 
And also, like, so John Paul II calls that kind of the spousal meaning of the body. But it's also beautiful because, yes, it can be found in, you know, national union and marriage. But it also, whether or not you get married, like, it's part of, we, we are all made for communion, whether or not we end, you know, whether or not we get married or have kids or whatever. So there's still a way of living out the spousal meaning of one's masculinity or femininity in, in other ways, besides just marriage and sex, right? But I think, I mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. But the nice thing is, like, okay, in my, in my, in my evangelical upbringing, like, there was, like, no narrative. It was, like, everyone should get married, and if you don't, you are sad. <laughs> We're sorry, you know, like that's what it was. Like in order to be a complete human being, you you kind of have to get married. And so I think that the Catholic understanding, right? We're made for communion, but yet also, you know, I am a complete human being, as you know. But I'm not complete if I don't have love, and if I'm not giving and receiving love in a certain way, right? But I don't think the I don't think the Catholic view is that. Um, you guys ever read the symposium, Plato's Symposium? You know, like the Aristophanes speech where you got these like gender balls that are like kind of half. <laughs> and then like people are just kind of wandering around and looking for their other half, you know? Which is so funny. It's such a weird image, but my students tend to love it. They're like, that's so romantic. And I'm like, okay. Um, but I don't think that's the Catholic view, right? That, that we're like, in, like, I can only complete myself through a man, right? You know what I mean? Um, if that makes sense. But there's so it's almost like I'm I'm a complete person, but then the the collaboration of men and women can be this like synergistic kind of thing. Like we we become more than the sum of our parts, right? Which makes sense from the Trinitarian. Exactly, exactly right. Each person is yes. a full person. Exactly, that's great. Okay. Oh yeah. There. So we'll go. Fuzzy sweater and then <laughs> Yeah, hi, thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated with this topic. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking, I was thinking, how much is modern gender theory neo gnosticism that mm -hmm. says that your body is bad and that you have a secret knowledge to your salvation to mm -hmm. truly expressing who you are? aside from your so-called assigned gender role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I do think that there is a there is a denigration of the body in that it's depersonalized, right? Like it's almost like there's this person and then there's the body. The body doesn't carry its own intrinsic meaning. It's kind of like, it's just, it's like meat suit, and then you have to like make it meaningful. Um, and by the way, this isn't just, you know, I mean, there's a way that like non-trans people do this too, you know, I mean, certainly like just look on Instagram for like five seconds, you know, and how like everyone's body has become this project. Um, but at the same time, I think there's, this is kind of just what, Aunt, you know, Angela was saying about how there's also this almost idolization of the body right um and i do think that in some in some like trans narratives there is this profound sense that like the body is so meaningful and i need you know it needs it needs to express who i am it's not this like oh the body doesn't matter at all and so i can just sort of ignore it right there's like this suffering that's created or the suffering that's felt because the body doesn't feel right um so yeah, there's this interesting. I would. I don't know. Like there is this kind of kind of Gnostic flight from embodiment, but there is also this this like a desire for the body to be meaningful, which I think is not Gnostic. I don't know. That's interesting. Though. Yes. Thank you. Um, I I I love your comment about um, you know reality reality fights back. Um, Yes, I often think about Jurassic Park too. I don't know what you're about to say, but I do. I do. Yeah, this idea that yes, technology can bring us so far, but life finds a way to get around the technology, right? So reality can find a way to get around our technical fixes. Um, and you know, as someone who studies like history of philosophy, right, can look back at a variety of 
they could say, oh, well, they, you know, they would have endorsed X, Y, Z, but they didn't have the technology. Or just so that right, right. line of thinking, mm -hmm. particularly about like, women and gender, but not limited to that either. And um, so what do, we, what do we do about the technology that yeah. makes it possible for someone like David, the, you know, yeah. and that's only possible with the example of David, you know, for, with technology, um, the David Dreamer example, right? right. It's always possible to, you know, cut your hair to cross dress or whatever, right? Those are relatively straightforward technological fixes to yeah. try to make some kind of statement about right. your gender identity or sexual identity. But, but what do we do about about the technology around uh, around gender specifically? But then also just, you know, building off of some of these past comments, I learned recently that there are now filters for some of these, you know, TikTok. I don't I don't understand these things, but filters <laughs> are some of these things where you can actually filter what your body looks like. Yeah. Um, right. for the purposes of technology and social media. Yeah. So, so what do we yeah. do about technology? <laughs> I don't know what we do, <laughs> but no, so you're bringing up two interesting points, right? So there's the internet social media piece, and then there's more the kind of like medicalization piece, right? So, well, one of the re one of the, the things that concerns me about the gender paradigm is that it doesn't speak the truth about what's actually technologically possible. So there's this promise made that you can change your sex which actually isn't possible because one sex is, it's a totalizing reality of your whole physiology, right? Like if you're male, your entire, you're an organism and your entire organism is organized according to one particular reproductive niche, you know, or, you know, like, um, and, and so you can alter the physical appearance, um, some sec you can you can mimic some secondary characteristics surgically and hormonally um, through some medical interventions, but you can't actually. I don't, I don't know how I'm graphic doesn't get, but you know, like you can make a wound, but that's not a vagina, right? Because a, a vagina is actually like a really amazing organ that's like self-cleansing, you know, and it's like the the you know connected to a uterus, right? Like so, it serves this this kind of function in a woman's body that, um, you know, you can create a facsimile of that, but then, you know, you have to find a way to stop the body from healing that wound um, forever, right? Um, you can go on cross-sex hormones and again, develop some of the secondary sex characteristics of the opposite sex, but at least say for a woman who's taking testosterone, but then your internal organs will begin to atrophy until the point they have to be surgically removed, right? And I don't think people are being honest about that. Um, like if you if you just like go to like the Planned Parenthood website, they'll list some of the, um, like the, they talk about gender affirmative hormonal therapy and they'll list some of the side effects. And all the side effects sound super banal. You know, it's like, oh, you'll grow some body hair. You might have mood swings, right? But it doesn't mention organ atrophy. Right, so it's, people aren't being honest about this, first of all. So I think certainly anyone who's considering any kind of medical route should have a real clear idea of what they're signing up for, and that's not happening. Um, I think there are probably a lot of reasons for that. One, I just, I think people, honestly, I, I, I worry that this, the affirmative approach is almost a way of abnegating responsibility. It's a way of saying like, you know, oh, you're experiencing this, then here's the solution for you, and now I don't actually have to really better understand why you're suffering or why you feel like you need this, right? It just becomes a way for me to kind of like wash my hands of it. Um, I also think there's a lot of money that can be made. So a lot of money that can be made, right? If you, if you decide to pursue medical transition, you will have to be on cross-sex hormones for life, right? Because this reality pushes back thing, right? As soon as you stop, then certain parts, you know, certain aspects of your physiology will kind of revert back to um, the natural state. So, um, so I think that's a big problem and people aren't being honest about what, I think there's a lot of, in the US, especially with the profit-driven healthcare system, there's just so much money that can be made if we like medicalize healthy children for life, right? So I, that's, that's concerning. Um, and then the social media thing, I, I do think that's one of, in, when I was doing research for this book, um, one common thing, the one thing that was common in all 
the kind of first person narratives about people who chose transition, the one common thing was like this immersion in um, the digital world. Like just in, you know immersive being on the internet all the time. And so I think that creates this I this like sense of disembodiment in a way, right? Like we have these online avatars and yeah, we can like, you know, I can go play like in you know, a World of Warcraft or something and I can be like a male troll, you know, it doesn't matter. Like I I can be this totally different person. I can kind of create the body I want. Um, and even on Instagram, right? I can like, you know, become this weird like Barbie thing um, if I just choose the right filters. So I think that that it changes our psychology and our perception of ourselves. So sometimes I wonder if, if part of what's happening is people are trying to bring that that malleability into the real world, right? Um, and I also think that you know when you're when you're online, you know, and this is something I'm sure we all fall into. You just get into an echo chamber. You get into a bubble. And again, there's like a simplistic narrative that I think is being told to people who are probably having a variety of different experiences. So say like. The autistic kid who just always feels super different, or the girl who doesn't have friends, or you know, the kid who's had gender dysphoria since he was little. Like all of these different people are being given this really simplistic script. Like this is what's wrong with you, and this is how you solve your problem. Again, I think that's a way of like not really attending to the person in his or her circumstances. It's a way of just kind of making really complex experiences too simple and creating this like prescriptive solution um, but. Uh, uh, it's actually it's a question actually inspired by um, your your 2019 essay the eclipse of sex by mm -hmm. gender which i uh mm -hmm. have uh, read and recommended a sense and, thank uh, you i assume it was a crazy you know yeah. of this book but, yeah yeah it is um, it's like it's like a little embryo yeah so in that, in that essay <laughs> you, you make an interesting move which doesn't appear in this lecture which is to to ground the gender paradigm in what you call the contraceptive yes paradigm, right so which is a um in a way the technological mm -hmm. watershed you know the last absolutely 150 years or so so i'd just be interested in I want to give you the chance, I suppose, to sort of talk sure. about the contraceptive paradigm and why that is significant, you know, for, for gender. Right, yeah. So in the book, I kind of, you know, I talk about this, I guess, conceptual revolution. Ooh, conceptual and contraceptual <laughs> revolution. I just made that connection. Okay, I don't. Shoot! I already finished the book. I can't use that. Um, but there's also this revolution that's happening in terms of material conditions. Right, which is contraception. So these things are unfolding in tandem, and that's what's fascinating. So, um, like the same, the same technology that creates the birth control pill, the hormonal contraceptive, is the same technology that creates the um, like cross-sex hormone therapy for. So those those things technologically are happening like with the same doctors in the same clinics. Like that's happening at the same time in the 1950s. So that's all. That's very. That's very interesting. So my basic, that piece of the argument, I go into it a lot more depth in the book. Um, but the basic idea is that when our, when our society embraced contraception, I think it, it reshaped our cultural imagination in terms of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. Because prior to basically the 20th century, um, if you read any sort of philosophical discussion about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, we're talking about like roles in generation, roles in procreation. So there's just this, this like automatic acknowledgement of the fact that, oh yeah, being a woman, it might have all these kind of social meanings, but at the heart, it's like, it's the kind of being who can become a mother, the kind of being who can become a father, right? So it's this role in gestation. But what with the, with the pill, then once our distinct generative roles no longer become the ground for maleness and or for manhood and womanhood, then it really becomes about appearance, what we look like, and it also becomes about, like, how do I say this in like a polite way? It also becomes just a, it becomes about um, like how we have sex, I guess. Like, so I think actually pornography has really, it really shapes our understanding of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man. So basically, a woman is the kind of being that gets screwed, you know, and then a man is, is the human that does the screwing, right? And you actually see this, speaking about technology, um, 
like as the, the surgeries develop um, for um, sex reassignment, it, um, it the, the kind of like litmus test for like what makes a vagina is basically like, can it be penetrated, right? So that's really, so no longer is it, okay, so, <laughs> sorry, I'm like, <laughs> I can like see your daughters back there like, ah, and I'm like, there, you guys are fine. You guys are fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Um, well, once once you think about sex differences no longer as procreative potentiality, then it becomes imaginable that you can change sex if sex is just about being able to have either receptive or penetrative sex or just kind of looking like a man or looking like a woman. And so I do think that contraception has played a big piece in this because it's changed our just sort of assumption about what it would take to become the other gender, right? Thanks, guys, for sticking with me on that one. <laughs> well, and I will say, too, like, it's, it's actually pretty explicit. Like, if you read some first-person accounts from trans-identifying people, um, you know, like, Julia Serrano um, writes about Right, you know, is very explicit about this. Like I, you know, John, Andrea Long Chu, like Chu's definition of what it means to be female is basically like being sexually dominated, right? And I, I wonder too how much of just the kind of extreme fortification of our culture is driving uh, this phenomenon, especially among young people, because I think a lot of young women are you know hitting puberty on the brink of womanhood and they're looking around and they're being like, oh that's what it means to be a woman? Like to just be this like degraded kind of porn star? Like that's what my culture values in womanhood? Like being um, just being kind of this like sexualized object? I don't want that. You know? No thanks, I'll pass, right? Like that's understandable. Um, and then on the other side, I think there are some, some people who do want to be that, right? Um, some men who do want to be that, and so they pursue this kind of pornified image of what it means to be female. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your talk. It's really enlightening. Um, I guess one thing I sort of see, there's a bunch of different strands coming together, and you kind of mentioned how there's in some ways some contradictions in, the, in what people are doing because they want to assert both the they're coming from a philosophical root of anti-realism, and yet they want to assert the realism of their own beings, and I think that, but I think it seems to me there's at least two other branches of the, of the movement that, um, that, are, that are relevant and that we have to kind of respond to in some way. One is, um, uh, I, I think the thing you mentioned earlier, which is just that the shedding of, our, or the connection of particular views of what it means to be a woman, necessarily, you know, saying, oh, they have to be in the kitchen, and, you know, barefoot and pregnant, that sort of kind of things, which, you know, like it or not, has been sort of promulgated sort of in, especially in conservative circles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this kind of question, I think, so they're trying to break out and say, let's, let's break out of this, oh, right? Okay. And yeah. the other thing I think also is, sometimes with that simplistic view, is there's kind of like a, a not an acknowledgement of the, the cases that are complicated, right? Like, for instance, you know, people are sometimes born with like two X and one Y chromosome, or you know, like, and, and sort of like in this kind of simplistic view that people often have, just like you're saying, there. I mean, in some ways, the irony is when they're when they're saying, "Oh, you're transgender because you feel like a man." But what does it mean to feel like a man if you're not don't have a man's organs or mm -hmm. feel like a woman, or whatever? But in this case, you know, there's really this complexity, and, and there's sort of not an answer to this. Like the answers of people, I think, often are very like. You know, like, well, there's just men and women, and okay, there's yeah. a few weird cases, but it doesn't address those weird cases. And the word just can kind of subtle, right? It might just be internally, I really feel this. And people are like, oh, that's just your internal feelings. Is that really just our internal feelings, or is there perhaps something more? Like, mm -hmm. I guess, how do we engage in that conversation in a way that is sort of not dismissive, not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I. Yeah, I think, especially that second point, it's really important. Um, and I go into a lot more detail in the book because I think I think the the existence of um, conditions that are like disorders of sexual development or differences in sexual development 
the fact that those exist, I think those have been weaponized in a way in order to, um, not actually to help people who have those conditions and to advocate for them, but actually to just kind of like clear the sex binary off the table and make room for um, all kinds of other narratives about gender, right? But what's, what's interesting, yeah, I think there's a big misunderstanding of what sex is. I think even if you look at things like the gender uniform or the gender bread person, um, those kind of memes that try to explain all this stuff that are constantly being revised because things are changing every month or so um, in this world. Those define sex, again, as sexual, secondary sex characteristics, right? Sex is talked about as almost this like, this like, like Mr. Potato Head, kind of like assemblage of different characteristics that may or may not line up, but the kind of organizing principle of those characteristics is kind of completely ignored, right? So the intersex question is important, I think, because um, there's a lot of misinformation. I think it's being misused um, to, honestly, to deceive people and often by goodwill. Um, but conditions that um, DSDs is, is a more technical term. I think intersex is a more activist term um, that is less precise. But DSDs is a is a it's an umbrella term because there are all kinds of different conditions that can create irregularities in sexual development. Right. Sorry, what is DSDs? Sorry, differences in sexual development or disorders in sexual development. Right. I think um, disorders in sexual development is kind of more the term you see in medical circles, but then some people who have them, they don't think for different, anyway, whatever. That's why I say DSDs, because both start with D. Um, but I think people who experience those, they prefer condition-specific terminology. So the whole intersex card, it actually dehumanizes people who have these conditions, because it's almost like saying, oh, you have vaginal agenesis? Oh, you're not really female. We need to put you in this whole other category called intersex. You know, or um, you have, you know, klein syndrome, you're not really a man. Like, we need to kind of put you in this other box, intersex. But most conditions that are DSDs are sex-specific. They, like, they occur to female or male persons. Um, so that I think there really is a misunderstanding about what's even happening there. And I think either way, when we're talking about DSDs, the conversation needs to be about what the individual's particular situation is and what he or she needs. It should not be about let's completely revolutionary, re revolutionize everyone's thinking about what sex and gender are. So I think those conditions are being kind of misused as almost this kind of like gotcha card because it confuses people, right? They're like, oh yeah, well, sex is binary. And then, well, what about this and this? I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, sex is a spectrum, okay, everything you say is true, right? So I do think it's, it's really important to be able to respond um, to that question, but I think that the the way the gender paradigm conceives of people with DSDs is actually pretty dehumanizing because, again, it narrows the boxes of what male and female are. And it exempts people who have maybe atypical genitalia um, um, from those boxes. Right? So, anyway, that's kind of like a short answer, but it's a complicated question. But, short, so TLDR. Intersex issues and trans issues are different and shouldn't be conflated, conflated. And when they are conflated, it's never actually to the benefit of people with DSDs. All right, thank you.